The recording has begun. Perfect. Are we ready to get started? Yes. Perfect. Well, um, let's call this meeting to order this meeting of the Housing Authority of the County of Monterey at 5 p.m. sharp. Um, uh, let's get started with um, the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Okay, um, Zulika, roll call, please. Okay. Um, Vice Chair Hans Buder. Present. Commissioner Kevin Healy. Present. Commissioner Bella Staros. Present. Commissioner Francine Goodwin. Present. Commissioner Maria Orozco. Present. Commissioner Yuri Anderson. Present. That concludes the roll call. All right. And then uh, do we have any comments from the public tonight? Do we have any comments from the public? Gabby, anybody uh, in the room or on the line here on Zoom? Uh, no one has mentioned any public comment online or in person. Okay, well, I'm going to turn it over for an exciting uh, presentation here for item number four. Uh, Zulika, take it away. Welcoming a new commissioner. Hey, we would like to officially welcome Ms. Yuri Anderson to the <laughs> Board of Commissioners. Uh, she's our second new commissioner. She attended the committee meetings to try to get a feel of those, and we're just very excited to have someone with your expertise to join our team. And I feel like now that we just have one vacancy with the current uh, board of commissioners that we have, that Hefflem has a very positive future because everybody's extremely committed to the community and the employees as well. So thank you. And also thank you again, Ms. Orozco, for coming. Yeah. And uh, welcome to Hefflem. Thank you. Is it okay? You could say something? Mm -hmm. The commissioners. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. Uh, thank you. Um, again, my name is Yuri Anderson. Oh, my Yuri, because there's not many around. Um, I'm really excited to be here um, joining the Hackham Board of Commissioners. I am a resident of Molina. I've lived there for 13 years. Um, I live with my husband and my two kids. We are fairly new homeowners. Before that, we were renting in Marina for 12 years. So um, I've experienced that. I grew up in North County. I'm a graduate of North County High School. Um, and I returned home after college and grad school and some work about 15 years ago. So I'm very committed to Monterey County. I'm glad to be raising my family here. During the day, I work for the county um, in the district board supervisor's office. So there may be occasions when I will need to recuse myself from conversations if they are related to issues of uh, litigation with county, just so you all know that. Um, and in my personal time, as I mentioned um, in one of the committee meetings, I serve as an elected member of the Board of Trustees for Monterey Peninsula College, representing Trustee Area 2, which is Marina and parts of Seaside. Um, and I also serve as uh, the leader of my daughter's Girl Scout troop, um, <laughs> which is very important to me and her. And it's a fun um, experience to give back to my community. Um, and I guess that's it. My kids are little, they're 10 and eight. So um, I'm just really honored to be able to serve my community in this way on the back of board. And, um, forward to getting to know all of you over the coming years. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri. Thanks, Yuri. Um, okay. Well, uh, we're going to jump right into it and get started with uh, item five, which is the consent agenda. Um, and item 5A is approval of the minutes from our last um not our last approval of minutes from the board meeting on July. This is July 24th. Um, 
if you're new, you can feel free to abstain. Um, uh, Zalika, actually, I guess I'm looking for uh, somebody to make a motion uh, to approve the minutes. I make a motion to approve the minutes. I'll second it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, Zalika, can we please have a, a roll call, please? Okay, Vice Chair Hans Buter. Yes. Commissioner Kevin Gilley. Yes. Commissioner Kathleen Bellastaros. Yes. Commissioner Francine Goodwin. Yes. Commissioner Maria Orozco. Yes. Commissioner Yuri Anderson. Abstain. Okay, that concludes the roll call vote. Okay, great. Um, let's move on to item six, which is reports of committees. Um, and we'll start with the personnel committee. Uh, Commissioner Ballesteros, did you, uh, did the personnel committee meet? Yes, we did. Um, Vice Chair Buter, we met and everything that was um, addressed, it's on the agenda under new business. Okay. Um, uh, the Finance and Development Committee um, also met. Um, uh, I would say that um, our business is also captured here. Um, you know, Commissioner Healy did have what I thought was a, a good proposal to um, have a little bit of a deeper dive as an opportunity for commissioners um, with our uh, CFO. Um, and Zalika, uh, just you know, to as a kind of an, a learning experience for everyone. Um, so, um, you know, Zalika, I don't know if you uh, solidified anything on that, but um, you know, we're we're all all ears um, as those opportunities come up. Um, I think it'd be a great opportunity for for board members to dig a little bit deeper, you know, into some of the numbers behind what we do. Yeah, so um, Gab is going to reach out to all of the board members, and we want to have a session with you two at a time to go over the budget and the financials, so that way um, we can really teach you what the reports mean, how to read them, and then answer your questions more in-depthly. Uh, it'll be better to do it two at a time so we don't have to have an open meeting, and then that'll allow for more learning uh, time. So we'll do it on your schedule. Gab a call to coordinate, and it'll be with me and Mr. Underwood. I had a question on that, um, and maybe it's a question for, I don't know, Yuri or Maria, you could probably opine on this, but does that become like a serial meeting for Brown Act purposes, or if we're not... Um, if we're not making decisions, um, is that acceptable? So long as no yeah. business is discussed or kind of one commissioner said X or Y, it's not a serial meeting. Okay. The receiving information. Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Michi. Yeah, last time we said we were going to um, start to consider taking that off of the agenda since we don't have the two board members on Michi anymore. So that'll be something that we can consider and talk about uh, later on. And then maybe next before next month, actually make a decision, put up a resolution as to whether or not we want to keep it on the agenda. Because we don't attend any of their meetings at this time. And I think the last one we did was uh, <laughs> February or March, something like that. And uh, for, for new commissioners, you probably may or may not already know this, but um, uh, MICHI stands for Monterey County Housing Inc. And um, it was a, a CHODO uh, that was actually created by the Housing Authority. And um, we've since uh, gone our different ways for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, which we can get into. Uh, most recently, we actually, our most recent development project is something where we, um, you know, we were involved in a transfer of a property to be able to make that happen. So um, uh, it's been, you know, it's been a little bit of a winding road and, you know, that name will pop up. So just so that you're familiar with what that acronym means. Um, okay, well, Zulika, I guess number seven is, uh, the executive director's report. Okay. 
All right, so the first item, uh, I put it on here as a priority informational update because I just wanted to make sure that all the commissioners took the time to read it and get any questions that you had because it's about the farm labor centers. The rent there for the past several years has always been between $500 to $700. I think right now it's like $750. And so the rent has been extremely low and with that, we hadn't been able to make needed repairs on the site. Um, and also, we have a lot of clients that reside there that they don't pay the 30% of their adjusted income for rent because their salaries are much higher uh, than what they would be for somebody newly admitted. So they've been paying maybe like 15% of their income towards rent at the property. So this year... The agency had money that was at risk of being recaptured from the state because they pay a subsidy on the property because we, it was not being used because the rents were so low. We sent in for an increase in the rents. Uh, the state approved it. And so now we had to send it to the USDA for them to approve it. During that process, the tenants, they can uh, oppose the new rental increases. And so, which they have, they called Supervisor Alejo, they wrote a letter to USDA, they don't feel that the rent increase is justified, uh, they basically just don't want to pay it. It's a drastic rental change for them, but the rental increase is still at affordability. With the increases for the rent, no resident will pay over 30% of their adjusted income, uh, income for rent. So we still meeting all the affordability criteria. The only thing is that since the rent was so low for so many years, it is a, a, a impact. So it may go up, you know, two, three hundred dollars or so, maybe more in some cases, because these particular residents never paid the 30 percent because of the rents. They always pay 10, 15 percent of their income. So um they opposed it. We haven't gotten this decision back as to if they're approved or not, but we need them approved for several reasons. One, again, the property needs repairs and rehab that we need the rent subsidy to be able to do. Two, if we don't increase the rents, the state is going to take the subsidy that is uh, marked for the properties because it hasn't been used in all these years. And then three, you know, just to make the property more desirable and keep it up to all of the standards, aside from even the major rehab issues, just regular maintenance, repair, the cost of uh, having staff, things like that. So what I was thinking that maybe we could do, uh, but it depends on what the USDA says, but some of the tenants that they rent going to go up, and all of this takes effect in January. So they got notice uh, earlier this month that this may be how much the rent would be in January. Uh, if it is a drastic case where the rent is going up, maybe we could phase it in so that the state will still give us 100% of the subsidy, but the tenant could be on some type of plan so they don't have to pay all of it at one time. But I'm not sure. I won't know till we hear back from the USDA office. But I just wanted to let you all know because um, they're really upset about it. But I think the one thing that people have to realize that um, the housing authority has never charged them 30% of their income. So by the rent being, you know, four, it was, I think it's all at four, five hundred dollars right now before this increase, the max was seven fifty. We have families over there make a hundred thousand dollars a year. And they paying six hundred and seven hundred dollars for rent, which is nowhere near 30% of their adjusted income. And it's just unfair to the other residents for the property not to be able to be maintained. It'll be unfair to the agency to lose all the subsidy because it's in the millions of dollars. Because then that burden will fall back on the agency and we don't, you know, we don't have it. But um, I think that we can reach some kind of medium to still help the tenants and still keep the funds. But as soon as they send something back to let us know, I'll of course let the board know. But I wanted to make sure that you, you know, was aware of it, uh, that this is what was occurring at the farm labor sites. I have a question, Zilika. So is this 30% of their adjusted gross income, is it only for those two? Or is that the way it is across for all clients? All that, clients, just 30% of their adjusted. Okay. So. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yeah, and um, you know, we have some other properties that they hadn't been getting their uh, rental increases properly. So this might be an issue for a while, but we're giving a lot of notice because again, if this is approved, it doesn't take effect until January. So huh. right at like six months or so, you know, five months worth of notice. And I know the community is maybe a little upset about it, but <clears throat> you had 10 years, maybe eight years where you didn't pay up to 30%. So hopefully you was able to use that time to save and do other things and your rent not still is not going to go over the 30%. So I, like, again, I just want to kind of point that out. Another question. So if you if if we do pursue a phased approach to the rent increases, how have you thought about how that would work? Or is it case by case? Would it be for everyone? How do you make sure it's equitable? No, we have to do a plan that meets everybody over there. So then that way, anybody who got an increase, whether it's a dollar or whether it's you know a thousand dollars, they'll be on the same plan. In X amount of months, your rent will up this much. And we'll probably do it by quarters. So in a year's time, they'll be paying the full rent. Mm -hmm. I've seen it done like that before. But I have to check with the USDA, see what kind of rules they have. Because they may have rules that we can't do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, because they wouldn't be paying at 30% if we do that. So they might have rules against that. So once they actually approve the rents, then we can see what kind of plan they'll let us pass on to the tenants. Another question. Um, so you mentioned that the tenants have already reached out to supervisors. Like, what sort of is there additional information that's available to us as commissioners, or is there a plan for engaging with others who might be receiving advocacy from folks who are going to be affected, so that we are, you know, best able to respond, or that those four supervisors who appoint us know what's happening? Well, really, at this point, the uh, tenants reached out to Supervisor Leho, and I know they sent the letter. And I can send you a copy of the letter where they said they are, you know, against the rent increase. But we've been at a standstill because it's a two-part process. Mm -hmm. So even though the state approved it, USDA hasn't approved it. So really, it's not for us to say because we don't know if it's going to get approved or not. But once the USDA responds and they either approve the rent increase or don't approve it or, or approve it at a lesser amount, then we'll be able to address any comments anybody have. But right now, we kind of waiting just like they are. Just real quick, uh, in, a, in regards to uh, to Supervisor Alejo, have, has he reached out to, to staff or to you? Uh, me and him had a phone conversation okay. about it, and he was sympathetic uh, towards the housing authority in the community. So his only comment really was pretty much the same thing. Mm -hmm. Is it a way to maybe phase it in or something? Because he did understand that they haven't ever paid the 30% of their income. And so it's a shock, but maybe if we can phase that payment in for them. But, you know, again, it's, you can't really yeah. make a decision until we get a decision. So that ought to be coming soon. As soon as it comes, then we'll be able to say, this is what we ought to do. Or these are the three choices that uh, we have to decide, like, what to do. Because it don't start to um, January. So I think my... Preference would be for them to approve the rents and let us let it phase it in on the tenant side, but still 100% subsidy on the state side, because that'll still help the uh, property out a lot. And I've seen that done, but just not with the USDA. So, any more questions about the rent increase? Um, are they on vouchers? No, ma'am. Okay. Can they apply? Uh, I don't know. Can they have vouchers out there? Like... They, they can use a voucher there, but several of the residents have already been called for Section 8, but they declined the voucher because the rent oh, because it was so much cheaper than actually getting the voucher. Oh, okay. Maybe they'll change your mind. <laughs> Sorry, one more question. So you mentioned that this these may not be the only properties where we haven't been keeping. Is there information coming to the board to kind of preview we or the commission know, uh, what's well we're doing a study right now kind of looking at all the rents and all of the properties to see where they're at mm -hmm. and then once they identify we can put that in the board packet okay yeah, right now we're still kind of looking at them but actually that's back here on the um, back too 
So just a, a few other things. The um, We've been working with Monterey County for the bridge funding application, and they did get awarded the application. Uh, they got $11.6 million for transitional housing for the next five years. They want to use our site uh, at PDM for the transitional portion of the housing. So we in talks with them about that. We're creating an MOU. That'll be presented probably at the next board meeting so that uh, you'll be able to review it and approve or disapprove of it. Uh, in the application process, we have two Two million eight hundred twenty-five thousand four hundred and ninety-two dollars that we can use for rehab at the property, and then we have another three million eight hundred fifty-four thousand four hundred and thirty-three dollars that will actually be rental income for the time for the whole time of the project. So, if we can put the MOU together, decide who's doing what based on the application, uh, get them a rehab schedule, which we did just do a CNA to say how the 2.8 million is gonna be spent. And then uh, the extension of services after the initial five year period, then we can go ahead, complete the MOU and uh, present it to the board. And once it's executed and the county executes, they're gonna give us all the money up front. So we would get the whole, you know, like $6 million up front. Uh, so we don't have to submit payments for the uh, five year term. The people that are stay there, they're still at risk of homelessness. Uh, they still uh, have some type of substance abuse or some type of supportive services is needed so it'll stay a sober living environment. So it'll meet all the conditions of the current deed restrictions. And if we do this with the county, at the end of this program, it's also the end of the deed restrictions on the property. So at that time, it won't have any more restrictions. And it's a HECM fully owned property with no subsidy attached. Uh, the application from the county would pay for the supportive services, uh, furniture. They are responsible for leasing the units, all 55 of them, and um, providing all of the rental income and if it's maintenance charges and things of that nature. So we would just still do our regular property management for the units that they house the individuals in and do the rehab schedule. But we again, we're working on the uh, MOU and we're working on the timeline now to be presented. This will really help this property. This property may have financial issues for the last couple of years. So this will really be a big help to uh, get that property out of the red. <laughs> and then the partnerships that it'll bring will help us in other areas that we're doing services to. It's a really good application. They have a lot of supportive services in there. And um, I think that it could work. We just, the really the hardest part is the extension because after the first five years, because they're giving us the 2.8 million up front for rehab, they wanted to have another 10 years to use it. So I had to let them know that, that was just too long of a period of time. Um, maybe we can do another five years with some type of stipulation as far as the rents and what they have to invest in the property. Because we definitely couldn't do 10. You know, we want we don't want to hold the property down. That's what's been causing problems with it in the past, why I couldn't make any money. But considering all the money they'll be putting up front, and if we can agree on the MOU another five years and it's something closer to the FMRs, then the housing authority really won't be losing any money. We'll still be helping the community and keeping this partnership, and we'll be out of the deed restrictions. But I highlight all of that when I bring the MOU because that's one thing that we really, really need to uh, look at. So uh, let's see, two more. One, uh, we review when well, we reviewing the properties and property management. Unfortunately, some of them is losing quite a bit of money every month because their expenses are exceeding the monthly um, rental income that they get. So we're making a plan about that to try to get those properties financially healthy. Uh, we'll talk more about that when, as we're going through the year in the budget because we're going to highlight those properties to let you know what was the shortfall, what happened, you know, what's a good solution. But we are working on that. Then we, um, oh, Pacific Meadows. 
Pacific Meadows is out in Carmel. It's 200 unit elderly site. Um, the housing authority has a ground lease with them for the next, well, it was for 90 years originally. We got 78 years remaining. And with that, they pay us $60,000 or either through residual receipts. Uh, unfortunately, the property hasn't been cash flowing. So we had received any payments, even though uh, it's possible to get $16,908,587 if they start paying. But right now, they've been having a lot of financial issues. They approached us and they would like us to take the place of the limited partner, Alliant Tax Credit Fund, because they're thinking about exiting the property um, for January 1, 2024. It's a really nice property. It looks really good. Uh, it's elderly living. It's surrounded by property owned by the housing authority. So it seems like it would be a good uh, opportunity. However, before we actually take the leap, we need to work up some more financials and kind of do some performance to see where they'll be in the next five or 10 years, uh, taking on this limited liability role according to the partnership agreements. If you don't put in any capital contribution, you're not uh, taking on any liability, but we just want to make sure about things like that because we don't want to go into the partnership and then all of a sudden we're responsible for all the money that they already owe out to other people or even with our help, they're not able to make the property financially healthy. So they did send a letter and asked us to be uh, partners. We have done a site visit and kind of looked at some preliminary um, budgets and things like that. But I just need to get a little more in-depth information before I can really make a recommendation, yes or no. Because right now, to be honest with you, I'm kind of on the fence because it's just really nice and it's a really nice location and I see a lot of potential. But they just have so much debt on it. I want to make sure that we're not getting into something that we assume and all of that you know, without ever getting any other cash flow from the previous years. Because it's got uh, a hood, um, it's got a hood uh, voucher on there for nine to eight units. They got a contract. And then the other units are tax credit. So all of the units are not being able to be charged. The regular rent that you'll see charged around here is kind of like five and six hundred dollars. Kind of the same thing we were talking about with the farm labor. And I believe that's the main reason why they hadn't been able to really get a profit. But it is options for that, but um, I will present that to the board along with, you know, any recommendation at the next meeting, just to see what, what it'll look like in like 10 years or so. And now to a little, uh, a little good stuff. <laughs> uh, let's see, the HCV, we applied for sell-side funding. We got awarded $18,610,303. So we have those funds sitting there um, as of September the 1st, if we need them to be able to house additional families. The INSPIRE program is starting October the 1st. That's the new way how they do inspections and REAC inspections. But for Section 8, you can request to stay under HQS for one year. So I did send in a request to stay under HQS for one year. With all the changes we got going on in the Section 8 program and just at the agency, if it's something that we can keep in place because everybody's already HQS certified, then let's keep that in place for the next year. That give them time to learn, inspire, and get all the yard training under their belt before we move on. Uh, I'm just waiting on the email to come back, but that shouldn't be an issue. And then for the uh, resolution number 3095, that's for the position for the director of housing programs. And it's a request to expand the salary range by $20,000 to make the job more competitive with neighboring agencies so that we can try to fill the position and get somebody to fill the position who is um, really has a lot of knowledge in HUD and HCV because we have quite a few issues we're working on in that department. So the better the candidate, the better it'll be for us and the team. And that's pretty much it for my report. Does anybody have any? Oh, one last thing. I forgot under my little list of one list. I just like to do these little year-to-dates to kind of see where we at. <clears throat> so for the HCV program, I did a year-to-date. And from September 2021 to August 2022, they leased 165 vouchers. But uh, we have surpassed that because from September 2022, 
to August 31st, 2023, we've leased 527 vouchers. So the team is really getting on track. They're doing a lot better. We still got things we got to work on. But I think that's a major improvement to have 165 for one year and then to go to 527 for the same period in the year is not over. So I just wanted to kind of point that out. And then I added on, I know you guys are used to seeing this. I didn't know I'm not a report. I want you to see the letters from HUD showing and explaining about the funding. Just so you can kind of see, because they send that stuff every month to tell you how much money you got and when is you going to get it, what program is for. So I just like to share that type of stuff so you can see what's coming in. And uh, that's my report, unless anybody have any questions. Yes, ma'am. I just have a comment under under the miscellaneous uh, report regarding um, the migrant worker project that's coming into Gonzales. Oh, yes, ma'am. Um, we did not know that this project was coming to Gonzales until about three weeks ago. Oh. And um, it's literally uh, an H-2A worker uh, program that will look very similar to is it Harvest Moon, which is across yeah. the way? Um, they felt that because it's not within the city limits, they did not really need to go through that process. It's in the county, and it's literally just right across the street, of course, next to our housing authority project. So as you can imagine, um, when we found out that this was coming, um, a few people were very, very upset because it's literally right, <clears throat> it, it's in the neighborhood of where we, have many families uh, that, that reside within that area. Um, the feeling from the council was that it's not that they're opposed to H2A housing, it's just the location and the mere fact that we did not know that this was coming and that uh, the county uh, did not inform us that this was happening. And I find it hard to believe that you get so far into this process, uh, having done housing, and that you do not notify, you know, those that are going to be uh, impacted by a project of this magnitude. So we're looking at 1,200 uh, residents, young men, who will be residing in the city of Gonzales, Gonzales, which is a population of about 8,900. So there is going to be quite a bit of opposition to this project, merely because of its location and the proximity of where it's going to also be this next door, literally next door to a housing, uh, a, a community project that we have been in, the, that has been in the works for almost 20 years, uh, which is going to include schools, uh, additional housing, uh, apartments, family housing. Um, and again, even the owner of the property, it was a little upset that this is being proposed. So I think it's very important for, um, as projects come up, that everybody who's going to be, you know, whether they're not in your jurisdiction area or not in your area, that they should at least be informed that this has happened. So they've set up some community meetings and our city manager got a hold of the client and said, whoa, uh, this is coming to Gonzalez. So she they basically said, I think you need to present this to the council before you have these community meetings in our in our in our city, so that's how we found out about it. So, um, well, it was actually after the community meeting when they reached out to they, us to let us they, know. They, I don't know how when they reached out to you, but they are planning to have at least three meetings. Well, she's uh, the young lady said she went to the council and it was opposition, and I think that's what triggered her to start kind of reaching well, out because yes. that's the that's when we got the yeah. notice too, and um. You know, as soon as I find out about stuff like that, I'm very transparent. I think everybody mm -hmm. just kind of need to know everything. And uh, that's why I put it under the miscellaneous. But she did indicate that she was having issues. She didn't go into a lot of detail, but uh, they just wanted to let us know and said they was going to try to take the look of Fano to kind of have it looking like the property that was already there so that it could build in some community buy-in. But, you know, I'm not really sure. <laughs> Other than, anyway. uh, yeah. <laughs> so, but if anything else come up, I make sure to always put it on the, you know, the miscellaneous unless it really impact another area. So. Uh, any other questions uh, for Zalika on the executive director's report?
I just had a quick one, um, Zalik. I was wondering if you could just give us a quick overview on the, you know, the corrective action plan um, and, uh, you know, what that'll look like in practice, I guess. Well, unfortunately for the um, VMS audit, we had a number of findings and concerns. So the corrective action plan is really going to take all the internal processes for doing the VMS, both in HCV and finance and put in a new system in place. And then um, aside from the workflow that has to be changed, we have to do a major overhaul in the HCB department. We, just like the preferences, we had maybe like 25 preferences. They have about 25, or, yeah, about 25 property codes. So all of these property codes go back to a different preference. But then when you use it by the property code, when it filters to the VMS report, it doesn't always filter correctly. And then the auditors are not familiar with the housing authority codes. So that was one reason it was hard for them to track back and see what really was supposed to be in what spot. Uh, a lot of those codes are unnecessary because we do have all the vouchers listed by the preference. So now we're transferring properties. So for instance, somebody who was in a welfare to work voucher, sitting in that property, they'll just be in a regular HCV property because we don't have a welfare to work program. So everybody that was set up in that property initially, they never got those particular type of vouchers. There's no different requirements for that particular type of voucher. So it really should have just been an HCV voucher with a preference attached. So we got to list out all of, that, uh, all of those types of changes that are taking place. And then who's going to be responsible for doing zero help? Who's going to be responsible for doing the abatement? Who's going to be responsible for the GL versus HAP expenditures? And how is HCV and finance going to talk every month to do the report and adjust all the numbers as needed? So your other software going to pay a, uh, play a part in this too. So really does HCV program, again, it's just getting like a whole new uh, look, uh, new structure, new workflow. And that's kind of what we're working on. But all of it will be in the VMS plan. Uh, we had an EHB audit that we closing out. That It took a little longer on that audit too because of things like that. So that will be indicated in the um, EHB plan. We had a PBV audit. That has some findings and concerns that also trickles down to the VMS plan. So that'll be in there. So each special voucher will be identified, the tracking will be identified in the time frames, and then we'll make sure it's mapped correctly. And we have to put a starting point. So the September VMS, it was too many corrections for it to be 100% correct. It's probably like 80%. But by the time we do December's, we should have 100% accuracy on the VMS report. And who knows that they're giving us time to get it cleaned up because there's so much that's got to be changed. And so we already have meetings with them once a month. During the monthly meetings, we'll talk about it, go over it, show the changes. And then they said they'll come back maybe in three years or so to do another audit. And then at that time, they'll verify all the changes took place and then all the numbers and stuff is right. But it's really like a complete overhaul of the program. Um, so the corrective action plan is actually kind of long, but I can share it with the board if y'all want to see it. But this goes all the way down to property codes, uh, the types of vouchers that we have, and the inter-office relationship between HCV and finance. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to just see it to be able to, you know, peruse it when I get a chance. Um, okay. You can share it, that'd be, that'd be awesome. <laughs> Um, along with the uh, audit. So you have both of them on the same email. So right. that way you can look at it like so. Okay. Um, and, you know, like you said, uh, you know, we've had a leadership change in that department um, with you stepping in uh, for the, the benefit of, you know, new commissioners. We, um, uh, we've got an, um, our past housing programs director, um, is no longer with us. And so Zalika has stepped in to handle that as we search for, um, someone new, which I think is a good segue to our next topic, which is, um, item 8A under new business, uh, resolution 3095, a resolution to increase the posted salary, uh, for the director of housing programs position. Um, 
Uh, Zawika, do you have anything to, to add to this? Um, just that I think this is a great opportunity for us to get some more talent. And then again, just to say we're not doing the $20,000 to pay somebody at the top range. It's just to have a larger range to draw in candidates. Yeah. Um, any uh, comments from um, from commissioners? Question. Um, so in terms of how this position is funded, how does that impact? Oh, it's funded through the HCV program. Mm -hmm. So it comes from HUD through the budget authority. Um, mm -hmm. The more vouchers we put out, the more money comes in. So that's why the $20,000 actually is based on what we have now with the anticipation of the program growing. So if we get a person and they fall in that range somewhere, depending on that job perform performance, they actually creating the funds to keep that salary going and maybe to increase it if we, you know, depending on how high we went. But right now, it's no problem to uh, increase it financially because of the admin monies that we already have. But that's the way that it'll grow or be utilization. And what is the range? I didn't see that. Um, James, what is the uh, it's the yeah. one fourteen now? Yeah, right. So eighty five is a starting eighty five thousand to one fourteen annually. Yeah. So then it'll be from eighty five to one thirty four. Yeah, I, I find that finding candidates for some of these positions, it's very challenging because these are very specific jobs that, you know, it's it's, it's just amazing. Um, you know, not too many people have that kind of experience, so we have to really and then like Santa Cruz, they start out, I think, at 120. Mm -hmm. And we don't even want to talk about Santa Clara. I don't know what's going on out there, but <laughs> yeah. So it'll just make us more competitive because you know, we have a lot of problems in the HCV program. So we can get somebody who they really know, you know, how to do a VMS, how to do utilization, how to work with your audience. That'll be best because the team is willing to learn. They just need a leader who has the knowledge. Yeah, I mean, I think my comment is, um, you know, this is what, like 4,500 units of what we do and the hard units, the actual physical units are like 1600. So, I mean, this is where the action is. And um, we just had a finding. You see the difference when leadership changes, right? If you actually go to the housing programs report and you look at the number of units leased, like after Zulika started to take over um, management, uh, you know, having the right leader in there is so important. And and like you said, like I'm bring somebody in from the outside who who is so it's not just you, but like somebody else who has that technical expertise that they can teach the rest of the team. Um I think it's super critical because it's been really hard to find, you know, bring somebody in from out of state. Again, Zulika, you know a little bit about this too, right? There's some there's yeah. some so um so yeah, I I think this makes a ton of sense. Um, and with the HCV position too, I think one of the things besides knowledge that you have to look at, you need somebody who really care about housing people. Yeah. Because they really need to be concerned about the people getting the voucher. So many people put barriers in the way when they take over these type of programs. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say we need somebody who they're all about utilization in the community along with that type of knowledge. Well, that's, I mean, that's the other thing is, um, you know, it's easy to get kind of complacent because it's sort of a nationwide thing, but our success rate is only 55%, right? So in other words, of everybody that gets, 100 people get issued a voucher, only 55% of those people are going to be able to actually effectively use it, right? And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, but, you know, getting the right people in this program, I think will make a real difference uh, for a lot of families. So um, yeah. Anybody uh, interested in making a motion on this item? I'll make a motion. I'll second it. For resolution 3095. Great. Um, it's been um, moved and seconded. Uh, roll call, please, Luca. Okay. Vice Chair Hans Buder. Yes. Commissioner Kevin Healy. Yes. Commissioner Kathleen Bellasaros. Yes. Commissioner Francine Goodwin. Yes. Commissioner Maria Orozco. Yes. And Commissioner Yuri Anderson. Yes. 
Okay, that concludes the roll call vote. Okay, uh, we're going to move on to item 8B, which is election of officers. Zalika, do you want to walk us through this one? This is the annual meeting, okay? So I did not know that until Gabby told me. I, for years, have been programmed for February. So <laughs> we get to uh, pick officers. So we uh, went through the bylaws to see what were the rules, what we had to do, who could do what. Um, the chair position is vacant. Go back and pull it just for a second. So I can put the norm up a little. Here it is. So the chair position is vacant. We need to vote on that. Um, Hans has been the vice chair twice. So he can't be the vice chair, but he could be the chair or another position. And all of the other members are actually eligible to do any position that, uh, you know, you would like. Now, according to your bylaws, you do it by ballot. So that means you would have to, uh, but Gabby, do they have an official ballot or they just kind of? Uh, last time they did it, they didn't open because it was through Zoom. Okay, I, that's better anyway, just to do that. So. We can do it that way. So what happened is we need to have a nomination um, from the floor for the positions. So we open the floor for the nominations for the chair. The commissioners, you will nominate uh, whoever you would like to be in that position. Then we'll do a roll call vote. Then we'll do the same thing again for the vice chair uh, position. And um, they will actually take effect. I'd like to nominate Hans Buter as chair. Okay, so we got one nomination. And I second that nomination. Okay, and let me do the roll call. Vice Chair Hans Buter. Uh, yes. Yeah, I hope you vote for yourself, Hans. Commissioner Kevin Healy. I'll second yeah. Commissioner Buter's vote and say yes, please. Okay, uh, look, and just so happened, Kathleen <laughs> Bevel Saros. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Francine Goodwin. Yes. Commissioner Maria Orozco. Yes. And Commissioner Yuri Anderson. Yes. Okay, the voting has passed for the chair position. Uh, Hans Buter, you are officially the chair of the HECM uh, Board of Commissioners. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you for reluctantly serving. <laughs> I believe it's almost been four years now. <laughs> Kevin, you, you still got me by, what, a, a, a good decade or so. <laughs> okay, so now we need some uh, nominations for the vice chair. Vice chair. <laughs> I'll second it. <laughs> okay, we got a nomination for Kathleen from Ms. Orozco and seconded by Ms. Uh, Anderson. We do a roll call vote. Yes. Uh, Kathleen. <laughs> All right, uh, Chair Hans Buter. Uh, yes. Um, Kevin Healy. Commissioner. Yes. Okay. Um, Commissioner Ballastaro? Yes. Commissioner Francine Goodwin? Yes. Commissioner Maria Orozco? Yes. And Commissioner Yuri Anderson? Yes. Okay. The roll call has concluded and Kathleen Ballastaro. Yay! Thank you. <laughs> so uh, moving forward through the meeting, Hans is now the chair and Kathleen is the vice chair. And let's see what your terms are. You serve one year terms with a two year limit. So we have to vote again next year in September to uh, change up positions as needed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Well, we're going to move on to item nine. Uh, which well, is uh, uh, Hans, excuse me. I'm sorry. Before we move on, I did have a closed session for possible litigation. Okay. Um, the person that I need to call is on Eastern time. So if it's okay, can I go ahead and call them and have them join the meeting so we can get that out the way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's uh, 
Yeah. Okay. Let me uh, text real quick to make sure. So, we were positive the replace. Well, wait a minute. Let me make sure. Oh, and did I grab the wrong phone? Here's a right and then a quick left. Uh, just email. Let me get the other phone. I'll be right back. I thought I had him in this phone. Gabriella? Yes. Um, this is kind of off the record, but I I have a favor to ask. Um, I noticed that Yuri is I mentioned that she was a Girl Scout leader from Marina. Yes. Which and anyway, I have a grand a granddaughter that's eight years old that um I would love to see in Girl Scouts. <laughs> and um I was wondering if um at your convenience you could give her my phone number. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll talk to her. Thank you. Appreciate it. No, it's somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. you know, I thought you were going to Starbucks. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Livers. So it's good service. I'm going to get this slam Francine, you have to you have to buy a pallet worth of cookies in order to enroll your granddaughter. Hey, I do. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the mints are my favorite. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I don't wear my clothes don't fit me anymore because of that. Okay, he said he can call in right now. Great. So yeah, we just stop the um, yeah, and then just wait one second. Are uh, folks floating back from uh, from bathroom break, etc., or do we have everybody? Just everybody, but Kathleen had to leave. Okay, great. Okay, well, um, is the recording started again? Yes. Great. Well, um, uh, the commissioners met in uh, closed session. Uh, this was item uh 10b government code section 54956.9 subsection d subsection 2 um and we discussed um potential litigation um and no action was taken at this time so we are going to um jump back to the information items um and start with item 9a uh the human resources report uh, good evening, everyone, commissioners of the board. Uh, welcome, new commissioner Anderson. Um, I also um, want to go ahead and start off with some highlights within the HR report. Um, I this month or next month, I'm sorry, is our benefit annual kickoff uh, starting October 1st through October 31st. Um, we do this every year. Um, this year, our focus is actually to um, streamline communication with the team to kind of be more transparent with them about the increases that they receive on the health premiums of it, because it is going up by 15%. And then also the other um, um, benefits that we're offering here within HACA. Um, so our communication strategy is, you know, having it where the vendors are coming into the building or either through Zoom 
kind of communicating with them. Um, and then also just trying to be there as the support team from an HR standpoint and giving them that kind of educational materials that they need um, to be more kind of choosing the right package for them and their families. Um, in our commitment with the employee well-being, um, we're also doing kind of um, focusing on kind of a more of a survey to see exactly if the benefits that we do have right now currently is what they, they want or they want to actually see a change in the near future of it. So I'm trying to see what we can do to kind of maximize that benefit package that we have right now currently. Um, aside from that, we are still going through our ongoing uh, union negotiations. Um, we have submitted our proposals to the union that um, we are that were approved from the board meeting last month, and we, we did receive an update response um, from the union to, of a recent meeting that we just did have, and we will talk about that more comprehensively in our closed session tonight. Um, just like with the legal executive report, the director of housing programs have been kind of a a challenging um, position to kind of recruit within the agency. Uh, we did have a couple of people that did apply. Again, it's finding that right candidate for, to fill the position, especially with our unionized environment and then the history of the of HACM. So hopefully with this new um, increase, which will go in effect now starting tomorrow, we'll revise the kind of job description and make it more attractive to those who um, want to kind of you know, join our team. Um, for the recruitment and staffing, it is the director of housing programs, but we also have the maintenance two position open. We do have a, a couple of lateral transfers um, from departments. So Monica Castro started in finance and now is our new eligibility specialist in section eight. We also did um, Edith um, Alapisco, which is our property management admin. She is now our eligibility specialist for section eight as well. Um, we did terminate uh, employees. So Josh Guevara Garcia who was our office assistant. And then Jesus Calderon and Jason Sotelo are temporary employees. And I do want to highlight that um, in the previous kind of new meetings that we did have, we were talking about kind of reducing the temporary employees overall. We did start out with 14 and now we're down to three of them. Um, just mm -hmm. trying to kind of keep every, you know, develop more permanent positions and give more promotions within internally to those employees that are still here. Uh, workplace safety issues. Right now, we still remain at zero. We did actually have a couple this month that we reflected for the next month's report um, that um, were involved in maintenance. So I will update you guys that with um, next month. Um, employee relations. Um, right now, we're still open with two. And that kind of summarizes the HR report, unless there's any questions from the commissioners. Any questions on the HR report? Very thorough reports. Two pages. Right. That's it. Simple. <laughs> okay. Um, if there are no questions, we're going to move on to item 10, uh, 9B, uh, the finance report. Good evening, uh, everyone. This is uh, Mike, and uh, pretty short report for this month. Uh, the audits, which has been the focus of the finance department for many, many months, uh, continues to proceed forward with uh, full power. And uh, we meet twice a week now with uh, no vote to coordinate and clear items. So that uh, hopefully will continue to speed things up. And we expect uh, you know, to be finishing 22 and then moving on to 23 here soon. Uh, it's a lot of work, and I think we're we're making good progress. Uh, the, as Zulika mentioned, uh, we did have a QAD audit, which was pretty bumpy, and many changes are going to be happening throughout the agency. And uh, of course, in finance, we're on the receiving end of those changes, and so we work with uh, Section Eight to make sure that we're understanding the changes and able to. Uh, get our accurate information uh, tallied. It drives our revenue directly, so it's just so important. Um, we're prompting and trying to make sure that we have monthly meetings now with our uh, operating managers, uh, so, so such as now Nora, you know, yourself, and, uh, Jose, Myra, uh, as you all have interest in the numbers, and we're trying to Make sure there are no secrets 
right? There hasn't been a lot of uh, kind of proactive communication historically. We want to stop that pattern and move forward. Um, there has been, I've been spending some time working on the procurement side, just trying to understand how things work and uh, determining whether or not we need to tighten that. And I think it's pretty obvious that there's room for improvement. Uh, uh, I found that uh, in talking with Jose and my staff in the procurement of the department that uh, we don't even have a form that uh, basically is used to qualify new vendors. So that's a little scary. In other words, we're, we're having people become vendors. And if you ask me to go and find the piece of paper where we did a credit check or a background check, or are they on a, some federal blacklist or, you know, I couldn't produce them right now. So uh, I have gone and uh, Zuleika, uh, I now have a new friend. Aaron from the Santa Cruz Housing Authority, and uh, he's given me some really good help and uh, looking at their website can see how uh, ours can look. And uh, they put me in connection with a, a tool where it can kind of track all your bidding process and can keep track of your contracts. And these are things that HUD wants us to do. And so rather than doing them by hand and some type of spreadsheet, we can just be using it and best part is it's free so it's some kind of some type of public software and they use it in santa cruz and aaron spoke highly of it so that's will be very good on the financial side in july we had uh 5.9 million dollars in uh, revenue in in hackham which is pretty good uh, about four hundred thousand higher than our budget up about eight percent of course when uh Section 8 has an increase in revenue. That usually means that we're going to be paying out. So as you collect, you spend. So it's sort of a really kind of an offset. Um, in Hackham for the month of July, we were about $100,000 uh, positive, uh, which is much better than starting off in a, a loss position. And last year, we had losses on in both sort of sections of our business. So it's good to start there. Uh, HDC for July, um, their revenue was about $200,000, which was uh, significantly below budget. The expenses were favorable slightly. Uh, the net loss for the month was about $140,000. If you add the two agencies, the two uh, entities together, or business units, maybe is a better word, uh, or just almost break even. So that was uh, very good to hear. And, uh, I'm pleased to have us start off in that. You know, break even is much better than starting off uh, <laughs> behind the eight ball. Um, and as uh, our chair mentioned, we will be having some basically learning sessions where we can help each other understand the, the the P and Ls and the, our cost structure and what affects what, and uh, that'll be beneficial to all of us. I think uh, the managers are are wanting the same, and I think we'll just have a better, uh, more well-rounded management uh, functionality by knowing the numbers as as we should and and as we want to. Any other questions for finance? Okay. Okay, um, hearing none, we're gonna move on to item uh, 9C, the property management report. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, I mean, welcome, Commissioner Henry. And um, I just wanna start by, um, I wanna thank Mike's team. Uh, they've been extremely helpful um, in this couple of months. Um, as Solika mentioned in her report, uh, we are looking at all the expenditures of the properties. I have some meetings set up with Mike's team next week, I mean tomorrow, uh, to go over some of those expenditures, uh, kind of review our, our budgets and where we're spending to kind of mitigate and minimize the uh, impact on the uh, properties. Um, we're also working in multiple audits that we have currently. We're going to have a visit from Korea, which is the investor for Castroville, uh, FOC, and we are um, had a visit from uh, the tax credit allocation committee for Haciendas 1 and Haciendas 3 this month. We also met with the uh, Department of Health and Health and Human Services for PDM 
and we've already completed, as Suica stated, the CNA for that property. Uh, for Casanova, uh, we started the repairs for the accident that happened at the property. The insurance and everything has been approved and the repairs have already started. Um, We've also uh, met with the residents for the farm labor properties uh, to go over the rent increases that Zulika mentioned earlier today. Uh, so many of their questions were answered and uh, um, overall feeling from the residents was more understanding of how the rents will work and how they will be affected. So that was a positive meeting. Uh, we also worked with uh, Rent Cafe and Mike's teams to set up the bank accounts for uh, receiving uh, electronic payments going forward for the properties. Uh, we should be done with that process hopefully this week. And um, we're also um, going to be um, having some meetings with MBS, which is a company that is going to be digitizing some of the documents that we need for the tax credit, tax credit files. Uh, we have a deadline to scan all those documents by the end of this year, and I, I had mentioned it in the past, but um, we're probably going to be um, having someone uh, do that service for us. Um, on the vouchers, um, we're up to date with all the vouchers. All subsidies have been received, vouchers have been processed. Um, rent collections, uh, where I am going over rent collection uh, monthly, and um, I developed a new report already that I have uh, to share with the um, executive director um, so that we can um, keep track of all the rents collected on a monthly basis and um, uh, just have a more accurate uh, numbers on what's being received. And uh, I'm also working uh, diligently with my team on the vacancies. We, it's a priority for us. I am pushing uh, our staff. Right now we have um, a lot of the vacancies that uh, are currently uh, available. We have tenants ready to move in. We're just pending some of the maintenance work. And as soon as the work is done, we will be moving people in and I'll be giving a, a Sulika a weekly update. Uh, on that progress. Um, the uh, uh, King City Migrant Center, the rehab at that center continues as scheduled. Um, they had uh, some work that needed to be done. <laughs> the uh, siding at the property um, that uh, they discovered a lot of dry rot that they weren't expecting. So that it's been a challenge for the contractor, but it's uh, now uh, back on schedule and it's moving forward. We have yet to schedule a site visit with the state agency so that they can come and look at the progress and they can reimburse uh, us for all the expenses we had on that project as of today. Um, and um, once the siting is completed, we will move on to the other pending uh, um, uh, repairs for the uh, rehab plan for that property. Um, Porto La Vista, we are having uh, to repair a bay window that's at that property. Um, it is uh, been very difficult to find a contractor that's willing to give us bids for that uh, project because it's a structural project and the location of the building requires a lot of scaffolding and it's been very difficult uh, to find bids. We've only gotten bids for one uh, vendor um, and it's it's been a challenge, but we have to repair it before the rainy season because there is a water intrusion on the bay window and it needs to be repaired. So I will keep uh, the uh, commission updated on that progress. Um, PDM, as, as Sulika mentioned, we're moving forward with that project. Uh, I sent Sulika the CNA, we will review it. And then we have a meeting with uh, the other parties involved in this project on Wednesday. And then um, we'll have a, a, a more information on that uh, in the coming future. Um, Outside of that, uh, you know, everything else is in the report unless the uh, commission has any questions for me. Okay, um, if there's no questions, uh, we're gonna move on to um, item 9D, the development report. Good afternoon, directors. Uh, just a few highlights. All the development activity is included in the board report. I have one item to update. The very first highlight in my report indicates that we were still waiting on the um, the release of the second capital contribution for the one park site deal. That actually has been confirmed as received. It's been wired out. So we are in receipt of the uh, second capital contribution. It's a little over $3 million, uh, roughly about 
28% of that is coming back to the development department for reimbursables and deferred developer fee. The remaining part of that was going to pay down the construction loan, so that's good news. Um, in addition to that, we're working on looking at alternate options for insurance coverage for the LPs. We have one request for quotes out to the HARP, and Ryan was working with a second potential partner to get options see how we can minimize the impact to the different limited partnerships for those increases that happened this year during renewals. We are also busy working on budgets with the finance and property management teams. We have successfully submitted the three USDA properties that were due October 1st. As of last week, they've been submitted and we're now moving on to the next 16, which are due by the end of October. Um, one park site, since we finished our second capital contribution, we're now working on our third capital contribution and collecting documents to submit to Hudson Housing Capital. Um, and we plan to have that done by mid-October if possible. And we're also working at the same time on conversion to permanent financing with Chase J.P. Morgan. And we have already submitted initial documents. We're still in the process of collecting additional documents. We need to have that done by October so we can um, submit our uh, our place and service package to TCAC by November. And we also are working with the city to collect our last of our retention for home and PLHA funding. All the required documents have been submitted and we're just waiting on their review and approval to release those funds. That will be another $94,000 coming into the development department. And the last item that's of highlight is that we are working with property management on identifying any warranty issues, any repair or replacement at one park site. Uh, the one year GC warranty ends on November 30th and we have until that day to make any submissions. Otherwise, anything after that will be coming out of the operational budget. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer if I can. Okay, uh, any qu qu questions? Okay, um, we're gonna move on to item 9E, the uh, housing programs report. Okay, um, the report is a little different, but it's kind of ever evolved because I'm trying to make it match up with the workflow to track all the changes that we're going through. So I added uh, this chart which I think is very beneficial because it breaks down most of the actions that happen back in the Section 8 department. And all of those tie into our ultimate uh, utilization number. So for instance, uh, two that I'd like to point out, the terminations. For the month of August, we had 13 terminations. In the past, we had been having 30, sometimes 40 terminations a month. So it was really offsetting the new people that were getting leased up. We're doing more uh, customer service now. And so now that's why the terminations that went down is ultimately like, unfortunately, if it's a death in the family or if it's something that the tenant did with the landlord, they owe a lot of money because they just destroyed the unit, something like that. But all the other issues, we're trying to give them customer service and work with them, work with the landlords to keep the person housed and still um, able to be in the program. Another one is the Raptors pending lease. I give you the leased units every month, but even with that number, there are still other units that are ready and being prepared to be leased. And so that's what that number is. So at the time of this report, there were 36 rafters that had been turned in for unit inspections. They were scheduled, but they were just outside of this time frame. So those 36 will be captured on the next report. So that way we can kind of keep a, a eye on, you know, what's upcoming and how many we have sitting out there at a certain point in time. Uh, we had 183 vouchers out for people searching, excluding the EHB program. So we had 183 people out uh, searching for housing. The EHB program had 107 people that are out searching for housing. We did 616 inspections from July to September the 6th, and then we had 261 HQS inspections reported and picked for the month of August. So that's extremely good because our inspections were behind. They had not been did since like 2020 or 2019. So we really catching all of those up. And then this is mainly how we get to house the people and keep up with the annual research too. Um, for PBV units, we had 685 units leased. 
And let's see, our waiting list was 1150. Actually, we down now to maybe 501. In the upcoming months, we'll have to open the waiting list again because we should be able to go through the 501 remaining probably in the next two to three months because we're still working on uh, 250 files, I think, that's outstanding. And so that way we can reopen the waiting list. We um, issued 143 vouchers in August and we leased 77. Uh, we leased 204 EHV. EHV ends at the end of this year, and then we have one date, um, September the 30th, that we've been trying to get a high utilization, so they want to recapture the two vouchers that was terminations, if we can be over, I think it's 80%, so I have to see what that is at the end of the month, but it's looking pretty good, because when we did the report, we was at 204, but when I checked earlier today, we were at 211, we only had 269, and in December, we had only at least 58, so that's a lot of leasing that's taking place in the last couple of months. This is a really low number, but I'm very proud to say we finally have one person that is a recipient of the Foster Youth Initiative voucher. The Housing Authority has 65 of those vouchers. It's for people, well, young adults that's 18 and up that came out of foster care to be able to get housing. And they had not used it since they got them in like 2020 or 2021. It's just been 65 sitting there. So we're working hand in hand now with the agency to get referrals, to try to get them people housed. So we had one person that actually got housed and I think it was two referrals. So we are doing monthly meetings and hopefully we can utilize all 65 of those to help those uh, individuals. <laughs> and let's see, the mainstream vouchers, we have 59 of those. We've issued 33. And uh, that's the one the city is going to work with us and help them with some incentive monies. So we're waiting to see how that's going. We're actually at 73% utilized um, because we have 4,917 vouchers and we've released 3,582. So we're making progress. Uh, we have a goal. We want to try to at least hit 4,000 by the end of the year if we can. Uh, hope we're going to make it. We're going to try our best to really <laughs> do it. But uh, one thing that kind of worked against us, just so you know, because when you get these reports, and I'll put it on that if it's a new revision, with us doing a lot of cleanup in the Section 8 program, we find a lot of errors. And so sometimes they uh, overinflated the number of vouchers in previous months. So then we have to go back and adjust it. But if it's something like that, I'll put on here it was revision and you know let you know what happened. But uh, overall, leasing is looking better. Inspections are looking better. And we're utilizing Yardage system more. And uh, I, it is more customer service friendly in the Section 8 department. And that concludes the uh, report. Any questions for Zalika? Um. Zulika, so uh, I feel like the last time we talked, I guess I'm looking at the math here. Um, so we're at almost 3,600 units leased by the end of August. So that gives us, but we need to get the, the next 400 done by, what's the drop dead date again? Section eight on a calendar year. So we need to have everything done by December thirty first. Okay, so so is the math you're trying to get to four thousand? Is it like a hundred a month at this point? Then yeah, Maybe? I want to at least try to get to four thousand to improve the uh, utilization. Now I would love to you know exceed it, but the thing about it is we're doing so much corrective activity in Yardin with the Section 8 program. We go out and we house 100 and then we find out that, you know, it was 55 sitting somewhere that should have came off two years ago and then we have to take them off. So it's kind of like a little seesaw right now. But I'm working with the eligibility team and we did, uh, just to kind of get ahead of ourselves a little bit, we had the event at Hartnell Friday mm -hmm. and we issued 112 vouchers on Friday. So the people came in and they went through the whole process while they was there. They all the information got checked, they got income certified, they got briefed, and they got a voucher and they are out searching. 
So we're going to have some more events like that to try to help get our numbers up. But at the same time, we're looking at, you know, day-to-day -day practices to make it better for the department. So fingers crossed, uh, Hans, that we can get another at least 400 out there and actually get them leased up for the end of the year. Yeah, I, I was trying to go back to my notes. I feel like at one point we were talking about even trying to do like 400 issues. Uh, we was. I said I want to do 400 a month. And I still want to do that. And I kind of got close, but it's the, unfortunately, since the yardage system hadn't really been used like it was supposed to, every time we go up and then we find something and fix it, it just drags the number back down. Mm -hmm. You know, because um, we had, I think, like 70 people, and I hate to even say this, but we had like 70 people that should have came off the program because they was maybe deceased or something like that. And we found it when we did the audit. And so even though we did a hundred and some units that month, we had to take all 70 of them off. So then you only really getting to see an increase of maybe like 30. Mm -hmm. So the cleanup work is taking its toll, but it is necessary for us to have good reporting. Yeah. Well, the numbers are moving in the right direction, which is, which is great to see. Um, uh, the only other question I had was, at some point, we need to agendize uh, kind of a policy. <laughs> What's that? The PBVs. Yeah. 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 Uh, look, I am ready for you, Hans. You let me know when you want to do it. I got all the information from the audit. I already talked to the people who did the technical assistance. And me and Jose even got our plan 85% complete for yeah. recommendation. So whenever all of the commissioners is available, we can have the meeting. You guys think could could we wrap it into our October meeting? Do you think? Mm, if you want to, if you it depends on how you um. We have a lot of calls and requests for PBV units. Yeah. And so um, we have about I think five or six hundred units now since the red units came offline. So we're going to have to decide if we want to put them out for development, if we want to use them on some of our properties that we already have to enhance uh, the financial health of those properties or, you know, what steps we want to do. And I think like a combo will probably be good, but we can do a segment on it in the next meeting uh, if you want to. Great. Yeah, let's do that. <clears throat> um, okay. Any Any other questions on the... Um, housing programs report? I have one. Um, uh, Shavika, have you um, thought about going over to MPC to do the same thing you did at Hartnell? Um, uh, yeah, we actually was looking at some other places. I had the staff giving recommendations of places where we could hold the events. So if you know somewhere that you think would be a good spot, you know, let us know. Well, could Monterey, um, Monterey Peninsula College is a, a junior college as well, and the rents over here are insane. They're they're not like I mean, Salinas is high too, but over here it's ridiculous. Over yeah, we here. can reach out to them and see if they'll let us use the space because okay. it worked out well. The staff enjoyed it. The people actually was extremely nice, even though they had to wait. We have no type of problems or nothing like that. And then um, just to do everything at one time, it was a big benefit. Yeah, I'll bet. Yeah. Um, but that's great. You guys did that. I don't know that that's ever been done, but um, I'm sure that um, the students at the um, MPC would really appreciate um, something like that. Um, okay, we'll check with them. Okay. Over there. Oh, you just, <laughs> see, we get the end. Because, <laughs> you know, I don't, I have to tell the staff. It seemed like I've been here a long time, but I don't hardly still know where nothing is. Or, you know, like, where is I, it? places and stuff like that. So I depend on them to kind of tell me. And sorry. <laughs> when uh utilization up, I still like to have these type of events because there's a lot of community engagement. And then you know to see a person come in, all they got is they pack it and then they leave, they actually got the voucher in hand and can just go find somewhere to stay. It's just amazing. Yeah. yeah. Thank it's you. Service. Yeah, and then the staff works so good together, the files are already ready, so it's not like we have to come back and do a lot of work to it. We did most of everything right there on site. So if we could do it again at, you know, another location, that would really help. Yeah, MPC, like I said, has a junior college um, 
that like Hartnell, um, Salinas is the Hartnell, uh, I'm, Hartnell is Salinas's junior college, and then Monterey Peninsula College is is the uh, Monterey um, College uh, junior college, and there's also the university. But I don't know. Um, they have housing there, so I don't know that they would uh, benefit from it. We never know some of the parents and different uh, people, because is anybody on the wait list? That, you know who comes out? Yeah. yeah. So it's a variety of people, and I think it was a couple of. Um, I don't know if it was a city council person or a supervisor, because I'm again still kind of learning them. But it was two of them who came and took some pictures. I forgot Orlando. Um, city. Yeah. City. So. So we could met, met the met the mayor of Monterey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we we trying to get out there. <laughs> you a great job, thank you. Always welcome to come to South County. Hey, <laughs> we actually talked about coming out there because a lot of the people out there on the waiting list they don't have transportation to come here. Yeah. So uh, we was looking at like a spot there to come and do a little mini um project. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Oh, so okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, I guess if there are no other questions, we're going to move on to uh, uh, the other closed session item, um, which is uh, item 10A, Government Code Section 54957.6, um, discussions of labor negotiations um, with employee organizations representing employees of the Public Housing Board or agency. All right, well, we're reconvening. Um, the board met in closed session um, for item 10A uh, related to um, labor negotiations, and we have nothing to report out at this time. Uh, we're going to move to item 11, which is commissioner comments, um, and we'll start with uh, uh, Commissioner Anderson for the uh, ritual hazing here. All right. Well, uh, I'll throw it right back at you. Um, HCV, VMS, HQS, Inspire, Michi, PVV, Uba, EHB, Chodo, Novo, Quad, PVV, Rad. So I would appreciate a list of acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> I did my best to, to discern some of the things in there, figured out that the uh, PDM was Bubble Del Mar. Um, <laughs> and housing choice voucher and all that stuff. But um, just in terms of orientation, I'm looking forward to a chance to meet each of the directors and sit down and learn more about your work um, and get pointed in direction support policies and org charts and properties so I can just uh, be the best board member that I possibly can for the, the organization. So looking forward to working with you all. <laughs> That's fantastic. And that sounded a little bit like a Billy Joel song for a second. Um, <laughs> I'm going to okay, move on to uh, Commissioner um, Orozco. Yes, thank you. I concur with Commissioner <laughs> and Anderson's comments um, and welcome again to the board. I, I feel the same way. I, I Some I knew, but others I was trying to think, okay, no, what, what, what does that mean? But um, yeah, that, that really would be helpful only because, again, this is my second meeting, by the way, so I'm fairly new. But um, I just want to say I do enjoy reading the reports. They're they're very thorough, and um, and just the mere fact that you you just summarize makes it go a lot quicker. I, I served on a board where they would actually verbatimly read them and read, and they were like four. Uh, uh, so that when I became chair, that was the first thing that I did. I, I made them cut at those reports. But um, once again, thank you, thank you very much for. Your, your your work and, and all that you do to serve our, our residents. Okay. Um and Commissioner Goodwin. Oh um uh, I just wanted to thank everybody for um all their wonderful reports and all the uh information that they provided. And uh for our, our new commissioners, there is such a thing as the um a list with all the acronyms. Um I, I have them in my possession. And I was looking oh. at this while, while the meeting was going on. Um, but um, I don't know if um, Gabriella has them. Um, our previous um, secretary uh, 
you shared them with me. Um, so you might ask Gabriella if um, she has access to that. Okay. Um, and um, I wanted to wel welcome you, um, uh, Commissioner Anderson. Uh, it's great having you. And um, I, you're going to be a, a great source of information and and uh, a pleasure to work with, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Goodwin. Um, Commissioner Ballesteros. And she had to leave. See, I can't even see who's there. Um, okay, uh, Commissioner Healy. Well, let's see if I can cover all of these points. Uh, let's start with my appreciation and gratitude to the staff, to Zalika, to James, to Mike, uh, to Jose, and to Nora for their reports. Uh, congratulations to Hans and to Kathleen on your uh, ascension of the hierarchy within the Housing Authority. And congratulations to Yuri and welcome. Uh, I think I covered all the bases. I'm excited about the future. And as it relates to the alphabet soup of the Housing Authority, um, Soon we'll convene the HDC meeting, which is the Housing Development Corporation for the Housing Authority of the County of Monterey. Enjoy being a director as well as a commissioner and welcome. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Um, okay, and that leaves me. Uh, I just wanted to say again, I think I've said this in the past, but Zulik, I appreciate the changes to the board report um, and the effort to give us more detailed information. Um, I think all the reports um, are giving us a lot of um, a lot more detail than we got in the past, which is which is fantastic. It's not just you know detail for detail's sake. I think it's relevant detail that aids in decision making, which is awesome. Um, and and welcome to um, uh, our two new commissioners. Um, I think you guys are going to bring a ton to the table. I feel sort of like a baseball team that added like two shiny new free agents. Um, to the squad. So, uh, you know, we're excited. Um, okay. Well, we're all going to see each other again here in this next meeting. We're all going to stay on the same Zoom meeting. Um, with that being said, we are now going to adjourn um, the HACA meeting here at 727. And simultaneously convene the Housing Development Corporation meeting here on Monday, September 5th at 727, running a little bit behind schedule. So we'll do our best to uh, cover the necessary items and do so in a lightning round fashion. And we'll begin with the roll call, please. Okay, um, Chair Kevin Hilly. Present. Vice Chair Francine Goodwin. Present. Uh, Director Hans Buder. Present. Director Maria Orozco. Present. Director Yuri Anderson. Present. And Director Kathleen Bellastaros is absent. That yields a quorum. So we'll move on to item number three. Do we have any comments from the public? Hearing none, we'll move on to item four, approval of the consent agenda. I entertain a motion. Uh, I'll make a to approve the minutes um, of the board meeting from August 28th. Second. It's been moved by Director Booter, and I believe I heard a second from Director Orozco, if that's correct. Yes. Roll call, please. Chair Kevin Healy. Yes. Vice Chair Francine Goodwin. Yes. Director Hans Booter. Yes. Director Maria Orozco? Yes. And Director Yuri Anderson? Abstain. That concludes the vote. Thank you. Moving on to information items, item 5A, the property management report. Uh, Mr. Acosta, anything to add or any additional questions from the property management report we heard earlier? No, everything's the same. No, no updates. Are there any questions? Thank you, Jose. Hearing none, we'll move on to item 5B, the development report. Nora, is there anything to add to the development report we heard just a little while ago? Or are there any follow-up? Oh, thank you. 
Are there any follow-up questions or questions that weren't asked in our previous meeting? Hearing none, we'll move on to our final item of the evening, director comments. And I'll follow suit with my learned counterpart, Commissioner Booter, and we'll start with Director Anderson. I have no comments. Thank you very much, Director Orozco. No, other than my original comments uh, that I made earlier. Thank you. Thank you. Director Goodwin. Um, pretty much the same as last meeting. Um, thank um, all the staff for all their hard work and their information they provided, and um, have a wonderful weekend. A week, like you'd say. <laughs> That'll work too. <laughs> Thank you, Director Goodwin. Director Booter. Um, no additional comments. Thanks everybody for staying late. Uh, bringing up the rear, uh, I have no additional comments other than to express again my thanks and gratitude and congratulations. Uh, two things I wanted to add for the record. One was the organizational meeting for HDC. I assume that takes place in October, if I'm correct. So I make sure that that's on our radar. Um, and two, I might suggest now that we have almost a full complement of uh, directors and board members that we put the potential for a retreat back on the agenda, at least for the development corporation, if not for both agencies. So with those two comments, uh, thank you all very much and everyone have a good evening. I will consider the HDC meeting adjourned here at 7.31 p.m. Thank you. Have a good night. Have a good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you all for your patience. Have a good night.